Welcome to Cinema Savants. Laugh a while you can, monkey boy. With your host, Algrip. No! Todd Vandenberg. What would you do with a brain if you had one? And Rob Steele. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. We're on a mission from God. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is a war room. Your weekly dose of movie news. Hey, you can talk to fish. Movie reviews. What if I told you the reality you know is one of many? And the occasional TV news or rumor. What do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? And that's when I shot him, Your Honor. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. If you shoot him, you'll just make him mad. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Are you suggesting coconuts migrate? And here we go. Yikes! And the Everyone sign. Yes. Good. On we go. Welcome to another partly spectacular episode of Cinema Savants alongside Todd Vandenberg. I am Marion C. Oop. Yeah, figure that one out. <laughs> That's appropriate. It'll come up later in the show. We've got some <laughs> wonderful, wonderful news, some bad news, and some what the hell is that supposed to mean news. Uh, all movie and TV related. Uh, you saw Kong, correct? I saw Kong Skull Island, correct. See, see, we're going to have some some Kong talk. It goes with Marion Cooper. Marion C. Cooper, um, there you are. See, that, I told you it would come back, and already we're what? Ten seconds into the show. <laughs> see, I'm feeling psychic. And we've also got a segment where who would who was the best person in some of the most famous uh, TV and movie roles. And that's going to be a fun segment to do. We're going to probably end the show with that. So stick around if you want to find out who the best Doctor Who was. See, Doc, Doctor Who was opinions. how, why, who, and, and who <laughs> might even be, because there are odds and they're posted. But we'll get to that later. Uh, <laughs> I want to get right into some of the new stuff with the yes, no kind of segment which actually does start off with Doctor Who. Uh, an upcoming episode of the season of Doctor Who has the return of the original Cybermen, which I, I don't know if you yeah. saw this or not. I think this is, this is a good thing. That is a good um, thing. I did see something about that. When, uh, when the Cybermen were introduced in this new, it's not a reboot, it's just a continuation of where the original series left off, Uh, They were Cybermen that came from another dimension and basically just all robot with human brain processors, which isn't really cybernetic. It's just, ooh, look, robots. Uh, These are more the Cybermen we're used to from Ye Olde series, which I thought were better. I mean, they look very different. They aren't going to – I doubt they're going to march in stereo like everyone else did. Um, And they look like they're wearing ski masks. I don't know why. That's just the way they were introduced. Um, <laughs> back in, what was it, 1963, 64? I'm sorry, <clears throat> 66. Silly. Me. I wasn't around yet. What the hell do I know? Um, it's going to be interesting to see them. That, that's a very big yes. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, another big yes we have this week uh, comes from a, a remake of Denis Villeneuve, he's going to be remaking Dune. Now, I, I actually enjoyed the original movie, no matter how much crack you have to smoke to have it make any sense. Um, <laughs> and no, it was nothing like the book. Well, okay, it was vaguely reminiscent to the book. It was a lot closer to the book than the X-Men movies. But I digress. Uh, Villeneuve <laughs> says he's going to be really busy over the next several years, so it's going to be quite some time before he can get to Dune. I consider that to be a good thing. That way they can take their time and do it right. I agree. Does that that make sense? I think it makes sense. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Uh, That's a huge, huge project, and that's not something you should slap together in a matter of months. Steve, get the camera. I'll get the van. Let's go shoot in the desert. No, no, you (laughs) you need more planning than that. Roger Um, Corman's Dune. We filmed it Friday. We edited it Saturday. Harvey Corman's showing was Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> that I would pay to see. Harvey Corman's Dune. 
with uh, oh. That hurts. <laughs> Oh, that hurts. Geez, I forgot his name. Tim Conway as uh, the Quiz Out Satirac. Um No, that that doesn't. Okay, I would watch it, but it, you know, I would need yeah, a few drinks first. It. You would watch it. You know, you would watch it. <laughs> Something else I would watch uh, was the new Wonder Woman trailer, which hit today. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to recommend it. It's free. It's online. Go, you know, knock yourself out. I did have a glitch with it though. Because a lot of the things that uh, it's not that we, there's you know storyline glitches or plot problems or I can't believe they cast that guy as this person. It's not that. My problem with, with this trailer was the theme song, and I know a lot of people really really liked the theme song they gave Wonder Woman in the Batman v Superman movie, mm-hmm. and I, I'm included. I don't think it's a bad theme, but when they use it in this trailer, because most of the music is very, it, it's classical-ish, you know, it, it's it's typical background movie music. Mm-hmm. Which I've said. And then when they start with Wonder Woman's guitar theme at the end, kind of, it's not quite heavy metal, but I'll go with hard rock theme. It's jarring. And the problem I had with it was this movie takes place during World War One before we really had music that sounded like that. Does, does that make sense? No. Do you expect you expect Warner Brothers to worry about mere anachronisms like music that didn't exist for another sixty years? They they can barely write coherent scripts. It's like that's the last thing they're worried about. And I uh, yeah, I I can see that would not fit and that would be jarring and that would take me out of it, but uh, you know. it, it, it's it's going to take you out of the, it is going to take you out of the trailer. That's not up for debate. If you when you watch the trailer, it's going to cuz the theme doesn't kick in until we see the Wonder Woman logo float onto the screen and you go, "Well, I knew this was a Wonder Woman trailer because she's been in it the whole time." <laughs> but when it's it, kind it of the kicks, clue, right? you go, kind of the clue. "Ooh. Mm, I don't know." But there yeah. is good, you know. This is still a good thing. I'm I'm putting this in the yes category still. It's a it's a good thing. Um, also a good thing. This Friday, if you have Netflix, and that's the way I'm going to recommend you get this, because yes, there are other ways. I don't recommend them because they're not legal. Iron <laughs> Fist hits this Friday. Yes, yes, yes. And I know a lot of people have reviewed it and said, oh, we don't like it as much as the other ones. You know what? I still think it looks like it's going to be fun. So, yeah, I'm going to watch it. Um, As will I. Absolutely. If you like the Marvel properties and you've seen anything on Netflix that Marvel has done, how could you not be looking forward to Iron Fist? I mean, because they've gotten – they started off at a really high level, I think, with Daredevil, and they've gotten, I think, progressively better somehow, and maybe Iron Fist – does take a take a step back, but you know I'm not going to not watch it because there were some bad reviews. Just like when we say, "Oh, this movie sucks," don't bother to watch it. We're not saying you're going to go to hell if you watch it, but watch it at your own risk. Maybe you will love it, and we will be wrong in that instance. Maybe you like Adam Sandler we're, we're films. Go watch a new Adam Sandler film. But yeah, I'm going to watch Twitch, Iron Fist definitely because I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm definitely looking forward to Iron Fist and. Uh, Personally, I expect it to be a little below the bar they've set because I, I was shocked. The bar is quite honestly. High. Yeah, I was surprised when the second season of Daredevil was as good as it was. And then when Luke Cage came out, it's like, are you serious? How can they keep doing this? So at some point, you would think they're going to stumble a bit. And if they stumble a bit, it will still be entertaining and good. So absolutely, I'm going to watch Iron Fist. Um. Speaking of stumbling and falling, and boy, would this have stumbled and fall, fall, fallen, felon, fallen, felon, fall, the felon, fall, 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 fall. <laughs> Wow. Okay, there was an interview this week with a guy named David Hayter, which kind of makes sense for the movies he produced. Um, he helped produce the X Men movies. Now. Uh, in his interview, he said that, you know, because 
Hugh Jackman is no longer going to be playing Wolverine and Patrick Stewart is not going to be Professor Xavier anymore. Um, who, you know, the, the, the casting concept came up and they said, when we were casting the original X-Men movie, we had some different ideas. <clears throat> and this, these are, these are big no's because I think, you know, the casting is not something they screwed up. It was the stories they screwed up at the X-Men movies. But originally, they wanted to cast characters like <clears throat> uh, Bishop, the character of Bishop. They wanted to be played by Shaq. Not the new <laughs> movie about the guy who goes and finds Jesus in a shed in Oregon. I'm sorry. That, you know, that was what we were talking about in pre-production. And I didn't realize, hey, I do have a story including Shaq, and here it is. That there one I go. don't mind as much. Um, either Janet Jackson or Mariah Carey is Storm. <laughs> Okay, maybe, kind of. Uh, oh. Vigo Mortensen is Wolverine. And okay, I can, this was, Vigo Mortensen is a hell of an actor. I can see him pulling that off. But the thing is, this would they, have been before Lord of the Rings. Does that change anything for you? No, no, because he, okay. he could pull – I'm sure he could pull it off. But how, what were they going to do? What, what, were, oh, what did they envision? Shaq and Janet <clears throat> Jackson? Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. We're not done with that yet. I can tell. Because <laughs> this is why it felt squarely into the category of, oh, hell no. Or Professor Xavier, <laughs> who is Patrick Stewart. Oh, can I guess? Can I guess? Want, Was it Howie Mandel? <laughs> uh, no. No. No, that, that's, um, that's closer to Patrick Stewart than Michael Jackson as Professor Xavier. <sighs> Um, that can, were they aware that usually actors appear in films as opposed to I, singers? I, see, I, my thing is when I read this article, I thought they screwed the movies up before. <laughs> but had they actually gone through with this? <laughs> Michael Jackson is Professor Xavier. Um, what was that comedy we came up with a minute ago? Harvey Corman's Dune. Uh, yeah, th- Harvey this Corman's would have Dune. been in the same category. It um, would have been Harvey Corman's Dune. I had read that Michael Jackson mm-hmm. wanted to play Professor X, and that's fine. He can want to play Professor X. That doesn't mean anybody actually entertains the concept of it. I mean, that's why I was okay with Viggo Mortensen as Wolverine because he is an actor. He's also a very right. excellent actor, but at least it, he's in the profession. He understands the concept as opposed to Mariah Carey or Janet Jackson or Michael Jackson. Or in yes, and Shaq has been in movies, and Shaq has to me he's been entertaining in those films. But no, he's he's been in in movies. I can't necessarily say he's acted. Well, true, I I agree. Yeah, but but wow, but that's not all. That is that that is that is just the first of those this week. Yeah, Um, (laughs) because more news keeps coming out about a movie that I was looking forward to. Until everyone became white, uh, Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> I, I keep finding more crap about this movie to not like. Um, they announced that uh, Scarlett Johansson, who is playing the lead in this movie, who in every incarnation so far has been a character named Multiko Kusanagi, who is um, let's at least go with Asian. You know, it, it, it's a start. Uh, they announced that no, she's playing a character named Mira, possibly with the last name of Kusanagi. Um, no, no, they ha- I mean, I understand that the the manga books, the animated movies, the OVAs, and the TV series have pretty much all had different storylines. They're all reboots of the same thing, but there have been consistencies in the characters. And changing her name is not one of the things they have done so far. Don't do it now. Of course, there are other things that it, that popped up. There was another trailer that popped up this week uh, where there's a character named Bato who has cybernetic eyes. And they're right. blatantly see, cybernetic. Uh, he removes the them in the movie. And yes. you kind of go, wait, what, why? They, they don't come out. That, that's one of the things they even – I think they even mentioned it at one point. They don't come out, but they do in the movie because, hey, 
sure, why not? We we don't need to follow any previously established storyline. Law- You'd think this movie was made by Fox. I don't understand what's going on with this. <laughs> my wife, right? My wife, who does not watch anything anime, uh, you know, both my daughters, well, two 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 thirds of my daughters do. Um, my wife doesn't, but even my wife has looked at this trailer and said, I don't know anything about this show other than you like it and what I just saw was wrong. That's a hint. <laughs> she doesn't need, if she can pick this stuff out. Hello. The hell is the matter with you people? Anyway, that's not the only that 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 that's just two no's this week, but I've got a third. And I know we have a, a an unofficial slogan on the show of we watch movies so you don't have to. <laughs> I'm going to throw out I'm going to I'm going I'm to add trailer to that. I saw the trailer for a movie called Woody Woodpecker. Now, some of you may remember Woody Woodpecker from the cartoons back in the 19 – God, it was the 1900s, wasn't it? Um, long, long time ago. I believe it was. Uh, and they had a hard time making these movies into seven – or making these cartoons seven minutes long. Now there's a hour-and-a-half movie done in computer-generated graphics – uh, interacting with actual humans, and you know what? Don't even look at the trailer. Ignore the movie. Again, these are just our opinions, but you know what? If you watch the trailer, you're going to agree with me. Uh, it, it just, it oh, it looks bad. It looks, it, it looks worse than Garfield looked then. It's no, don't do it. Don't don't even release this. Make this a straight to video release. Straight to that $5 bin at Walmart. Actually, I just came from Walmart. They have a 388 bin. Just put it straight in there. <laughs> That's Love, lovely. lovely. Thank you. 388 Thank you. bin for our new releases. That does sound excellent. And I do have a kind of this week um, because I'm not really sure what to make of this uh, because it's, it's not my genre. Stephen King um, – no one really knows what to make of the upcoming, and I found out it's a two-film adaptation of Stephen King's novel, It. Now, it's my understanding that Stephen King's movie, the, the movie's based on Stephen King's works, rather, fall into one of two categories, either brilliant or 388 Walmart bin. <laughs> um, and now the the rumors have it. Well, actually, it's not even a rumor. He has come out and said it that uh, said that Stephen King himself says he likes this version. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. Uh, what's your take on the upcoming it? I'm looking forward to it because the TV version was fell far, far, far. To me, the only good thing about it was Pennywise the Clown, which was Tim Curry. And the book has an awful ending, and I don't mean awful as an oh, that's terrible. I mean as in it sucked, and it was like I had the feeling that Steve got tired or bored and didn't know what to do, so he just wrote it the ending the way he did, which was crappy. As the only Stephen King book I've read where the ending was like, seriously, dude, that's how you – when I take that back, Under the Dome also had that kind of thing. But anyway, I digress. I believe he also really, really liked Maximum Overdrive, which is one of the worst damn Stephen King films. Um, so his, his taste in his films, and he notably hated The Shining. So, yeah, really, one of my favorite one of my favorite writers, but he did not like the liberties that they took with The Shining, which, as we talk a lot of often, is like, why did they change this? Why didn't they just keep it the way they did? And I, at the time, I can understand why, like, they took away the hedge animals in The Shining, because they weren't able to technically do it and make it look good. So Kubrick said, nope, that's out. We're going to do something different that we can physically do, so they put in the maze. But Steve's taste in film in his own adaptations is not always the best. So, yeah, Uh-oh. just because he likes it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, though. I believe he loved The Mist, which I thought The Mist was a great, great thriller. So, um, yeah, it's, I'm, looking forward, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. But, but 
like you said, it, it's pretty much feast or famine with with the movies based on King's work. I mean, they're typically they're really really good or. Yeah, they're 388 at Walmart is what they should be. I I thought I'd quickly look up the director of the Woody Woodpecker film, Alec Zam, Z A M M. These are his most Alec Zam. Wasn't that the name of one of Shaq's movies? Film. Yes, it was. Uh, he directed Beverly Hills Chihuahua 2, Tooth Fairy 2, both directed to, to DVD. The Little Rascals Save oh, the yeah. Day, directed video. Uh, Jingle All the Way 2, directed video. Yeah, so he has there was a, a lot of. Yes, there was a sequel. And, uh, oh, dear. Yeah, so this guy is a pro. Oh, starring label Larry the Cable Guy, by the way. Jingle all the way to starring Larry the Cable Guy. So he has – this is his strength in making crap that goes direct to video, so I can understand why he's doing a Woody Woodpecker film. Wow. I get it now. <laughs> um, Jeez. Okay. If that's what you want to do, you go right ahead. That scares me more than Stephen King. Holy crap. I should. Um, I have a bunch of Disney news that came out this week. Some of it is good. Some of it is just weird. Uh, For example, (laughs) Disney has come out and said, point blank, that when they redo Mulan as a live action movie, the entire cast call is going to be Asian. Now, this sounds like it's going to be a good thing. Let me tell you what I'm expecting. I'm expecting it to star Asia Butterfield, uh, (laughs) Scooby-Doo villain Asia Shanks, uh, China from the WWF, and just for fun in the the lead, Nikki Moulange, because that's how they think her name needs to be pronounced. Uh, I'm I'm expecting there to be a considerable number of uh, non-Asian actors in this Asian-based movie, because... (laughs) No one gets it. They're not getting it right. The, the, this goes along with another story they came out with this week um, where they're doing a cast call for the live action Aladdin movie. Uh, and the casting call went out for actors ages 18 to 25 from the Middle East. And well, as hey. soon as they show up, they're put on Donald Trump's no fly car- no flying carpet list. <laughs> That's just what I thought. Um, They'll have to film it on location because they won't be able to get into the country. Oh, hey. my gosh. Just a bad idea. Um, somewhat, I don't know if this is good news. Danny DeVito, who does not fall into either category of Middle Eastern or Asian, um, he is, however, been cast in Tim Burton's live action and completely unnecessary remake of Dumbo as a character named Medici. And I, I'm sure there's a pun in here somewhere. Uh, The character is described as someone who runs a small circus that gets eaten by the bigger circus financially. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. (laughs) There's that. Wow. Another trailer. I'm not sure. Sorry. Yes? No, I was just going to say, Danny DeVito is is fun regardless, so. Yeah, okay. That might be the one thing, reason to watch it when it, it's in the 388 bargain bin. Although it's a Disney movie, there so it'll go. take a long time, regardless of the quality. So, um, there was a trailer that confused me this week because it sounds like something Disney would do, but it wasn't. And I heard Universal is making a version of this, but this isn't that either. There's a new trailer for a film called The Little Mermaid, and like I said, it's not the live action Disney version. Uh, Universal apparently got a hold of uh, the rights and is somehow developing their own version. Uh, this is actually one that looks like it should be on the Lifetime Network and mm. seems to star Shirley MacLaine and the train from Hogwarts. <laughs> I, that, that's all I got out of the trailer. I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention because it has to do with a circus. I did not see Dumbo in the background. Uh, if you're interested... Knock yourself out. I, it has nothing to do with the Hans Christian Andersen storyline. It looks very much like one of those after-school specials they had back in the 70s and 80s. Wow. Um, that quality, so yay for them. But coming to a theater near you or a 388 Barkin bin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see. Speaking of trailers, though, there was a Star Wars trailer that leaked this week. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. It's not real. 
Um, there was some footage that was shown to investors earlier this week, and descriptions of it have leaked online, but the trailer that's online is not real. The official new trailer will not be released until the Star Wars Celebration, which is uh, it's in April. I've forgotten the date. But they did announce that there will not be a Star Wars Celebration next year in 2018 with no reason given. That's um, rather odd. It, it is. Can't they afford they keep, it? They're going to be coming out with a Star Wars movie a year for the next millennium, and you know, just oh, we're not going to have one. No reason. I don't get it. Um, let's see what other news do we have this week. Star Trek and Harry Potter news, because you wouldn't think those go together, would you? Um, no, but they do because they. They announced the a lot of the cast this week for Star Trek Discovery, and we know that the main character is uh, going to be played by Sonequa Martin-Green as the character Lieutenant Commander Rainsford. Um, and we just found out who the captain of the Starship Discovery is, and he is not the main character. Captain Lorca will be played by Jason Isaacs, who some people may recognize – as uh, Draco Malfoy's dad from the Harry Potter movies. The, the creepy guy with the long white hair that seemed to run away whenever good guys showed up. Um, Interesting. Good actor, actually, because I've seen him in other stuff. That just came out and kind of threw me off this, this week. Um, other people that are going to be in it, uh, character actor Doug Jones is going to be playing someone in prosthetic makeup. Like he does, and uh, a guy by the name of Malik Penkoli, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, uh, Indian actor. So there is a bit of diversity, but there were like 18 other people they announced, and they're all white people, which, which does bother me a bit, because that was one of the big things in Star Trek is, look at all the intermingling of, uh, you mean humans come in more than one color? When did that happen? Um <laughs> it kind of bugs me a bit. I, I would like to see a bit more diversity because it's Star Trek. That's what it's there for. I don't know. Maybe more people are going to be in prosthetics. I don't know. Uh, you would think that they would. Uh, that was that was one of the major points that, was the that hallmark. Uh, Roddenberry was doing back then, is showing exactly. that hey, we can all live and work together. So yeah, it's. Uh, that would make sense to have a diverse cast and not so much Doug Jones wearing different prosthetics on different days so they can put him in you know, the seven characters. Although that would be kind of fun. Right. He'd, I'm, sure, I'm sure he'd enjoy the paycheck. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see, a bit of superhero news, I suppose. They announced that the X-Men film is next – the next X-Men film is not going to be called Supernova. And they're not sure if it'll be R-rated or not because they haven't gotten around to bothering to write it yet, which makes <laughs> me wonder if they wrote any of them in the first place. Probably not. Um, uh, <laughs> just throwing that it out. Is, it, is, it is funny because Logan has made a, a, a ton of money, and um, they painted themselves into a bit of a corner. In case you haven't seen it, that's all I'm going to say. But they painted themselves into a bit of a corner uh, with, with the yeah. movie. So, And not that it really matters because they have screwed around with the timeline and the characters so much in X-Men. You know, this, you know, everyone knows that Jackman is not playing Wolverine again because he's tired of it and he wants to eat bread. And the same with <laughs> – that's what he said. He said, hey, I can finally eat bread. So good for you. Keith. Exactly. And uh, no more dehydrated. Professor X will no longer be around. So, well, not as Patrick Stewart, which he hasn't been in the last couple incarnations. We've had different actors playing different characters. It's it's a big change to see if they're going to what they're going to do with Wolverine. If they're going to just, it would be smart for them to do a couple non Wolverine films, and or just throw. Could completely change the casting and go with a grown-up X-23. They could do that too, whatever. Um, yeah. 
But, it, you know, like I said, we actually talked about Logan yesterday on Baseball Beer and Barbecue because Ted went to see it. And Ted, was, he liked it, but he said he was a little disappointed. He felt kind of empty. He kind of felt like at the end, is that all there is? It felt anticlimactic. And I, I understand what he means. I kind of felt the same way. It just – it seemed to be in an odd way to end the series. Um, and it's got great reviews and – Again, it's it's the best X Men movie to me outside of Deadpool, which kind of fits the franchise since X Two. So it's been a long time since they've actually made a, a decent X Men character movie. But right. again, the fact that this could have been a great movie uh, still bothers me. If they had again, if they had followed just a couple of the concepts from the Old Man Logan that this was based on, like for once, make him Old Man Logan. That would have been kind of cool, as opposed to middle aged Logan. It, you know, it, that would just would have been – you would have had the more, more feeling for the character, and they made a couple choices, which the pathos and, and the anger and the fear and the frustration and everything that Wolverine went through would have been so much stronger if they'd just done it the right way. So most people who are, have seen this, not read the adaptation, and like I said, I hadn't even read it until – I should not mean the adaptation, the original source – until the day after, so right. you know, if, if you haven't seen it, and it say, if you haven't read Old Man Logan, don't go see Logan. You'll like it much better. Just trust me. But if you want to see eventually a better version of the story, make sure you find it because it's a much better version of the story, and you feel much. The, the the feels are much better in the comic than they are in the film because there's more going on. I'll just I'll just say that. Because I really don't want to. You mean the book is better than the movie? No, it can't be. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? And, and again, this is this is what they've done with the X Men movies over and over and over. They have, God, decades of excellent source material, and they waste it. <laughs> Absolutely blow it almost every time. It's just makes almost. you wonder. Makes you wonder. Well, yeah, almost every time. Well, okay, every All time. Right. Um, every time. <laughs> every time. Yeah, because it, yeah. even X2, which to me is the best one, it could have been vastly improved if they'd done a few things differently. So I will anyway, agree. Enough about Logan, Circle but it is making clear. bank. It is making serious bank. So they will produce like five more crappy X-Men movies for sure. Yeah. Speaking of characters who have gotten old and, and recasting and stuff, there have been some published odds as who's going to play who's who's going to play Doctor Who next, and uh, some very un- names I was not expecting popped up on this list. I'm just going to give you the top three coming in at five to one odds. Anthony Head, uh, if you don't remember who he was, he was uh, Niles on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and <laughs> you know what? This actually might work. Uh, because uh, somewhat famously, the last two doctors already had previous roles in Doctor Who as different characters. Anthony Head did have another character. He played a, a vampire kind of thing. Um, hmm. I've forgotten what the race was called, but it was during David Tennant's uh, tenure as Doctor Who. Uh, the first episode with Sarah Jane, come, when Sarah Jane came back. Anthony Head huh. was the head vampire guy. Um, uh, and I can see that working. Uh, at four to one odds, though, is Tilda Swindon. I was going to mention Tilda Swinton as a joke, but I can totally I, see that working. She was mentioned as a joke originally, I think, but all of a sudden she is you know, number two at four to one odds. Who knew? Um, but the, the leader in the pack at the moment is at three to one odds is a guy named Chris Marshall. Uh, from a series called Death in Paradise, neither of which I have ever heard of before. So make of that what you wish. Uh, there is, however, a big rumor that Matt Smith wants the role back. Hmm. So interesting. Maybe you know regenerates into a previous form. There, you know, there's not a rule that says he can't do it. Um, yeah, there wouldn't be. Any, but that I raises mean, the question. Um, raises the question, who was the best in the role of Doctor Who? See? See, I have a segue into a segment we were doing. Clever, clever. Uh, 
you know, it was something I think you brought it up last week of you know, coming up with like a, a top three of who played these roles best. Right. And Doctor Who was on the list because that, the show has been around since 1963 um, and had a number of different actors play the role. Some of them, some of them better than others. Um, who, who are your who are your three favorites on this? Well, how, is that how we're doing? Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'm gonna go three, two, one, back and forth. We'll do three, two, one, back and forth. My number three, Wait, and I would be probably people would be mad that I only have him as number three, but my number three is Tom Baker. Um, played the role the oh. longest. Yeah, see, yeah, there's there's hate mail coming in already, Pro- probably from Rob. Um, no, just had a very. There, to some extent, they're all distinctive. That's whole, the whole point of it, of course. But Baker was very odd, in a in a good way, quirky. and yeah, quirky, like extremely quirky. And the character is supposed to be to some extent, but he almost defined that. I mean, before that, I've seen some. Of the, I haven't seen all of the old ones before Baker. I haven't even seen all of the Baker's roles. But I mean, he absolutely he set the standard for, okay, this is how this character acts because a lot of times his motivations aren't what we, you would expect the motivations to be because he's not human. So he Hello? should be quirky. He should be weird. And Baker, I think just did it brilliantly and you can't beat the scarf anyway. So that too. Uh, my number three is one that people forget that he even was Dr. Who uh, Sylvester McCoy who was the guy who ended the run originally and no, it had nothing to do with the actor himself. Um, <laughs> he, he was also very quirky and just, just an odd duck. I believe he was described as, but he worked the character. I think so well, he was especially coming off of uh, Colin, no relation to Tom Baker, who for me was uh the Roger Moore of Doctor Who's. It, he knew. It's not that he was <laughs> bad, although his his uh, his suit was hideous. It, it's not that he was bad. I just didn't like him in the role. And to go, go back to Sylvester McCoy was kind of a throwback to Tom Baker, which made the role more enjoyable for me again. That's all I'm saying. I I enjoyed Sylvester McCoy. He's got the cool hat. That too. He also reminds and me a little, and he also reminds me a little of um, Rowan Atkinson. A bit. Just, phys- Who did play the role once, but it was in a uh, a comedy special. But anyway, <laughs> uh, my my number two is off off the beaten path, so to speak. It's John Hurt. Um, obviously okay. it was just for a few specials, but they were recent, and John Hurt. Uh, again, one of the actors who is no longer with us, sadly, but what a, what a great actor! And it was a it was a different um, version of Who because this was like the this was the Who at the end of it all, and yes, it made the character different. I mean, it was he was up against it finally, and and Who is Who is up against it in every show, of course. And then he mangles, gets his way out of it, and he's up against it even worse at the end of the series, and then he gets out of it by regenerating. But this was that's a totally different concept. And Hurt is Hurt is a brilliant actor, and just didn't want to say Matt Smith. So John Hurt was my second <laughs> my second favorite. Um, nothing wrong with Matt Smith, but you know it's just a, a right. little off the beaten path a little bit. Your number two, sir. My second. My second is, uh, and this is going to get a bit weird, Peter Davison, uh, who followed Tom really? Baker, which is wow, a very hard thing to do yeah. because Tom Baker defined the role, and then to follow it, you kind of go, oh, uh-oh, <laughs> this guy yeah. can't be as good. And I don't think he no was fun. quite as good. He, he had a different take on it, a bit, mo- a bit more serious, a little bit more grumpy. But at the same time, he did. You know, it was a different take on the character, but it was still an enjoyable take. Um, the the you know the stories didn't change that much. You could still follow along with everything, and it worked. And here's a here, uh, Whovian 
trivia that comes along with this. Moving in. Um, Peter Davison's daughter played in an episode called The Doctor's Daughter, which was one of uh, David Tennant's episodes where the really? doctor was cloned and became a, a blonde girl for a little while. I didn't know. Um, oh, cool. cool. Now, oh, it's going to get better. Give me a minute. Now, I, I the shall. actress who – I've forgotten the actress's <laughs> name, and I shall look it up when he does his – when Todd does his number one. Um, Peter Davison's daughter, who played – a cloned version of the doctor, the actress is actually married to David Tennant. So the doctor's clone of himself is also not only his daughter, but his daughter-in-law and his wife. Georgia Moffat. Welcome to Kentucky, everybody. Um, Georgia Elizabeth Tennant. How interesting. Thank you. Um, Yeah, it was just a, Bizarre, intricate web, and it was this that was never strange. aired in the states. But there was you can find this on YouTube. There was a short uh, called Time Crash, which has David Tennant and Peter Davison in it, both playing the Doctor. It's about a five minute episode that they did for, I think it was for Red Nose Day. Uh, in oh, the that's UK. cool. That's cool. Um, Check it out. It's it's a it's a cute short that actually takes place during an episode. I shall. It'll make uh, sense when you see it. I shall watch that after immediately on the end of our show. I will. Um, I will find the link and put it on the website cinemasavants dot com. Go awesome. visit the site, but wait till the show is done. How's Love that? It. That's lovely indeed. Uh, my number one is David Tennant, and I am f- completely aware that. He's probably not the number one on most people's list, but for me, he did. He personified Doctor Who uh, uh, the best. Um, he just had. A, he just seemed to have this, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but he seemed to have this wounded quality to him, where he seemed to me yeah. the most human of the Who's of the of all the Doctors. <laughs> Shouldn't call him the Who's the Doctors, and because uh, Who's not his name, damn it. But anyway. Um, and that that worked really well for me. And he's a terrific actor. There's a um, uh, BBC series actually. The third series is out now called Broadchurch, which is David Tennant plays Very like a homicide detective. Oh yeah, it's amazing. And this is the point of acting because you'll watch that and you'll think that's not the guy who was Doctor Who. He looks the same, but he's not a, at all the same character. It's like, of course he's not. I mean, it's a different character. But uh, he, he just he was very vulnerable, which is odd for the doctor because a lot of times like Peter Capaldi, he ain't that guy. And yeah, he, he shouldn't be every, every doctor is different. And I, I like the tenant version the best. That's my favorite version of the doctor. Plus Rose was not difficult to deal with either. Not a bad companion. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, Just saying. For me, for me, it was Tom Baker. Yeah. Um, Tom Baker was – he was my first doctor, and actually this is going to make a whole lot of sense when you see Time Crash because one of the big lines in this was uh, where, where David Tennant talked about how Peter Davison was the doctor he grew up with. Huh. So a, a line in, in the Time Crash episode, you were my doctor, doctor, and <laughs> for me, my doctor was Tom Baker. Um Although technically my first episode was was the end of John Pertwee, uh, but he regenerated into Tom Baker at the end of that episode, which is why I came back and went, I don't know what the hell I just watched, but I'm watching the next episode to find out what the hell that was. <laughs> Jeez, I was, I was like 10 years old when that happened. I came in halfway through the episode. There's a guy in a suit and a hovercraft and some spiders, and then he turns into a guy with big poofy hair and lots of teeth. What the hell is this? <laughs> and and that oh. happens a lot, though. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that that was your first Doctor, because that happens a lot. That becomes, because that's your first exposure to the character, so that becomes your 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 favorite. And I do want a, a quick shout, not a literal shout, because that would be strange, but I do want to mention uh. Christopher Eccleston. Eccleston, because yeah. he was the first Doctor when they rebooted the series. And... um. Again, very quirky, very odd. He just he just looks strange. Um, 
and I don't mean it's the ears. Yeah, it's the ears. Actually, there's a character, <laughs> the heavy metal, the original heavy metal animated film. There's a character in it, and it looks like Chris Eccleston modeled for the damn character because he's got the the ears and he's got the somewhat prominent nose. He's tall and lanky. I mean, it looks so much like Eccleston. It's it's weird. It's really really weird. Um, and you'll know the character when when you watch heavy metal again if you ever get a chance to watch it, dear listener. But Eccleston helped relaunch the, the thing entirely and was only in one series and boom, he was gone. But uh, it was very cool. He was, he was excellent. And I really have, has there, have there been anyone who couldn't pull off who, I mean, it seems like they made a lot of excellent casting choices. They I, mean, did. I can't think of one um, where it's like, Oh, this guy sucked because that happens. Unfortunately, in long running series, uh, the closest we, I think that could happen with would, would, would have been the Colin Baker episodes um, for me because he was he was he wasn't a bad doctor he was just very standoffish and not very likable but, you know that that might just be me I've heard Colin Baker himself to, is actually a very nice guy but you know what do I and know? again it was the way he wanted to play the role you, you, you see movies like that and TV shows sometimes where they want the character to be a certain way. This have to be their traits, but they have to. There has to be something likable about the character because otherwise, why are you watching? Or something compelling? Yeah. It might not be likable, but something compelling at least. So, yeah, that's kind of important, especially when it's supposed to be the hero. So there's, there has to be something there for you to latch onto. And again, it has nothing to do with the actor. It has to do with direction and the writing. And this is what how we want this played. So, so I want to ask you this. Ask Doctor, Who fan, Doctor Who fans are called Whovians. Um, I was trying to come up with, what are James Bond fans called? Well, they're into bondage, obviously. Bondage. Yeah, they're, ah, they're, okay. into, they're into bondage. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, bond is, is a good one to go into because Holmes, I think, will be there's a lot to talk about with Holmes. <laughs> Not as much as this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll just kick off uh, James Bond. And again, there haven't been that many people who played James Bond. Uh, even going back to, yeah, there have been a few here and there, like Barry Nelson played him on a TV version back in the 60s, whatever. But um, and I have not seen that, and I have a feeling it probably would not be one of my favorites anyway. So uh, my number three is Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton, not... Um, to me, to me, let me make this clear. To me, he did not stand out, but there was also nothing egregiously wrong with him, as there was with a certain gentleman by the name of Roger Moore, who was fun in a lot of roles, like a, the Saint. I thought he was great, but to me, he was absolutely wrong to play James Bond. He doesn't look like he would enjoy throwing a punch, let alone killing somebody. And how is this guy supposed to be? This deadly agent is like made no sense ever. So big no for Roger Moore. Uh, big yes for Timothy Dalton. Uh, he didn't get enough credit to me. Timothy Dalton didn't. No, absolutely not. Um, for me, the only time Roger Moore worked was in For Your Eyes Only, and I think that was his first one. If not, it was one of the early ones. Um, he became too gadgety, too reliant on Q. I didn't like that. Uh, for me, and I'm going to screw up our whole thing, and I apologize for this. No, go right ahead. <clears throat> my, my my three bonds, and I'm going to do these all at once because I can't really put one in front of the other, uh, are, are Timothy Dalton mm -hmm. and Sean Connery and George Lazenby. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm just grouping them all together because to me, they were, they all played the role the way it was supposed to be, to be played, you know, uh, ruthlessly. He's an assassin. Right. That's what he does. Exactly. Um, you know, I mean, we do get the. Uh, I'm going to call it the, the the Bangkok theory. This came came from a friend of mine who developed this a long time ago. Um, that it, it came from uh, the Rush song. Uh, God, was it the the last train to Bangkok or whatever their song is? I've forgotten the name of it. But he said, we were talking about which version was better, the live version or the studio version, and we came to the conclusion that the version you hear first is going to be your favorite, nine times out of ten. Right. And 
you know, it's because of the way Connery played it, and he was first. Dalton played it the same way. Lazenby played it the same way. That's the way I want my Bond to be played. Right. Does that make sense? Passage to Bangkok. Passage to Bangkok. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I feel I the same way. I on a freaking Rush song. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> I need more sleep. I, I totally agree with you. That's why Daniel Craig is my number two because he brought it back to – he got away from the Pierce Brosnan charm and, and jokes and all the rest of it, and they brought it. And, and, and obviously, like you said with Roger Moore, it's not all the actor's fault because it's written that way. Right. You know, oh, let's do more gadgets, let's do more jokes, blah, blah, blah. But Roger Moore, to me, never was convincingly could ever have been an assassin. Uh, Daniel right. Craig absolutely looks like he could kill somebody. Timothy Dalton <laughs> looks like it. And Sean Connery, and again, that was the first the first Bond, my first Bond. Um, and especially in the earlier films, ruthless, cold-blooded, no doubt whatsoever. They put... They played the I'm going to kill somebody theme when he went to check his mail in Dr. No. That's how dangerous <laughs> this character was at the time. <laughs> Did you notice that? true. Yes. So, you know, I, I was watching uh, Dr. No the other day because it was on, and I'll, I'm going to go down and check my mail. Dun, 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 dun. I'm like, he's checking his <laughs> mail. He's not going to shoot people in the lobby. What the hell? But, yeah, that, that's how dangerous the character was, and that's the way he should be. There's a line in at the end of uh, Roger Craig's first foray as as Bond, which to me is probably the best line in a Bond film, and and it's the essence of the character. You know, they ask him, "Well, what I'm happened sorry, to who, 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 who's Roger Craig?" Daniel. Oh wow, <laughs> not that guy, Daniel Craig, Roger Craig. I've yeah, the, the, the former. Can, the former the former yeah. pitcher and pitching coach and yeah. baseball manager played uh, played James Bond. Yeah, Daniel Craig at the, at the end of the first film, they ask him, "Oh, Thank you, you know, what about what about the what about the woman that you were going to marry and love?" And, and his comment is just this cold, flat tone: "The bitch is dead." That's James Bond. I mean, yes, it's and it's not that he's emotionless because he does have emotion, but he represses it because he's a s- screwed up puppy. <laughs> and he is. He is. Yes, he kind of would is. have to be to do that. And yeah, that's why those three actors work for me because not that they themselves are screwed up puppies, but they are very convincingly portray that that aspect of it. Very cool. Very cool actors, definitely. Yes. Which brings us to Sherlock More Holmes. cool actors. Yes. Jeez, a lot of the Guinness World Record holder. For actors, um, <clears throat> in the Guinness Book of World Records, Sherlock Holmes is the most portrayed movie character with over 70 actors in over 200 films. And this does not count TV shows, one of which is going to be – actually, I think two are on my list. Um, there's a lot of pe- – oh, I, and I found out that the, uh, the fans uh, of Sherlock Holmes – are called the Sherlocked, which <laughs> sounds a bit Fifty Shades of Grey to me. But you know, if you go right ahead, I, I, I prefer the um, old term of the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, that that probably is a bit less Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, <laughs> depends on how we it yet. <clears throat> People have been playing Sherlock right. Holmes since 1899 on stage. A gentleman by the name of William Gillette, who who actually played him in the first Sherlock Holmes film in 1916. So the character has been around for a while, Just and a it's bit. been played endlessly. I mean, it's it's amazing because you know we were looking at this and it's like, okay, well we know who our favorites are. And well, oh, let's look at it and see just in case we miss somebody. And oh, no, we missed we everybody. Missed <laughs> like my, my God, for, for instance, Charlton Heston, he played Sherlock Holmes. It was those damn dirty apes. It was they those did damn it. dirty apes. Uh, Peter O'Toole. Elementary, my dear Watson. Peter O'Toole voiced yeah. Sherlock Holmes in a series of animated films. Um, uh, Matt it, Frewer? <laughs> Matt Frewer and, and, some Hallmark, and four Hallmark film, network films. Uh, John Cleese actually played him. Um, <laughs> Leonard Nimoy played him on stage. Larry Hagman played him in a TV movie. Yes, Larry Hagman. 
and Roger Moore also played him. Um, just <sighs> Peter Cook played him. I mean, it's just a bizarre <laughs> list of people. It's almost easier to say, okay, these are the eight people who have not played Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it, it's just quite a quite a list. And of, of course, we're not here to talk about these these seven thousand. But I mean, there have just been some terrific actors who have played Holmes. Uh, Edward Woodward, Patrick McNee, uh, ah, Rupert Everett, um, Jonathan Price played him. Um, and I, I'm assuming none of your are none of your three are are these particular people because it would be kind of weird to not like, yet. oh, I'll just blurt out this guy. Um, George C. Scott, which is not on one of my top three, but that's one of my favorite quirky, weird movies. They might be giants. He's a guy who thinks he's Sherlock Holmes, and maybe he really is Sherlock Holmes in, in 1971 New York. Awesome, awesome film. He's a mental patient. <laughs> And his and his doctor, whose last name just happens to be Watson, uh, gets sucked Uh-oh. into his his insanity. Uh, very fun movie. And George C. Scott is is awesome in the in the movie because he's not ranting and screaming at the top of his lungs as he often often does. Very cool. But uh, and one thing, Alan Napier. I wanted to throw that in there. Alan Napier played him on a TV episode. Played Sherlock Holmes. Alan Napier, who you may remember as Alfred. In the Adam West version of Batman on TV. Oh wow! So from Sherlock Holmes I know the name. in 1949 to Alfred Pennyworth, Batman's Butler. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people have, have played Holmes. But anyway, uh, I'll go to my number three. Um, my number three is Tom Baker. No, it's wrong list. My number three is Nicole <laughs> Williamson. And again, off the beaten path, played he played a little bit. Holmes in, in one film, and it's called The Seven Percent Solution. And to me, it's a great movie because it's it's one of these where someone thought, gee, what would this look like? And they combined the characters of Sherlock Holmes with Sigmund Freud. And Holmes goes to Europe to solve a mystery, imagine that, and meets Sigmund Freud. And Freud helps to, tries to help cure him of his addiction to a 7% solution of cocaine. So – Nicole Williamson is Holmes. He's awesome. He's brilliant. Um, Alan Arkin is Freud. He's wonderful in the role. And um, I'm blanking out. Robert Duvall plays Watson, and he's excellent in it, too. Super cool movie, and it's not really part of the canon, but it doesn't matter. It's a very, very cool movie. Should I tell you that Tom Baker did, in fact, play Sherlock Holmes in The the Hounds of the Baskervilles? Go ahead. (laughs) Why not? I'm just, I'm just throwing it out. I actually of wasn't did. sure of that, and then I'm, I came across a list and went, all right, and ooh, Tom Baker is on the list. Son of a, yep, there <clears> he is. <throat> my number three, <laughs> buddy. A little again, we're going off the beaten path. I think, I think I know who our number ones and twos are, maybe threes. My number three is Nicholas Rowe. Oh, who cool. a lot of people are going to go. Who the hell is Nicholas Rowe? He played Sherlock Holmes in a movie called. Young Sherlock Holmes, yep. about when Holmes met Watson at a boarding school and uh, shenanigans occurred. Can, is that the best way of phrasing it? Um, <laughs> the hallucinogenic cupcakes were spectacular. Uh, if you get a chance to see it, it actually is a – it's a good movie. It's it a is. cute movie, and actually the, the, the hallucinogenic cupcakes were kind of terrifying uh, when I was a kid when this movie came out. Uh, it, that'll make sense when you see the movie. It goes to Watson's eating disorder, apparently. But it tells you how Holmes and Watson first met in this particular incarnation. I think there was supposed to end up being a series, and there never was, which is sad. But it was fun. So go it's, find it on Netflix. It's been a I'm long, sure long there. time since I've seen the film, but as I remember, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, and he did a great job. I mean, physically he fits, you know, the tall, lanky, blah blah blah. But he he was very very good. Consider I don't know offhand how old he was uh, when he played it. Um, I looked it up. Sixty-six, eighty. It looks like he was, he was probably nineteen, eighteen or nineteen. That, fine, beat me to it then. <laughs> <laughs> but. He play, but I, well, how old was he supposed to be in the film? 13, 14 maybe, or a little older? Something like that. And he looked it. 
which is fine. He did absolutely. Look, uh, yeah, it it wasn't yeah. this thing is like, oh, let's get this thirty five year old guy to play the teenager. No, it's like he, it is a fun, very cool. This movie. isn't Beverly oh. Hills nine zero two one zero. Everything will be fine. Yeah, exactly. Very cool choice. Uh, my number two is uh, probably what most people right now will identify as Sherlock Holmes. It's Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, obviously, it's a modern take on Sherlock Holmes, but he does such a, a wonderful job of somehow maintaining the likability despite, despite the fact that he is an immense prick or bastard or jerk or however you want to put it. Because he's not a likable person. He was not a likable person no. in the books. And I, no, I, it's brilliant that they've updated it, but they've kept the character the way he needs to be. And, and they bring out little things. And, and this, of course, is the writing, but I was just watching one of the shows the other day, one of the early, earlier episodes. And Watson is uh, making fun of Holmes because he didn't realize that the, the sun did not orbit the earth. And, and Holmes yeah. was upset, and he just said, what difference does it make to me? It doesn't make any difference whether the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun. It, it, it appears to be that way, so since it has no bearing on my life, I choose not to remember that fact. I only have limited room for what I need to know. And just the way he says it, it's – Cumberbatch is excellent. I mean, duh. The guy's kind of a good actor, but he, he is so much fun as Holmes. And I like the fact that they um, – they make no apologies for having Cumberbatch play him as just kind of this irascible, worse than irascible. He's just kind of a bastard, but yes. he still manages to be likable, and that's very hard to pull off, I think, and he does a terrific job of that. <clears throat> Which is also why uh, he, he's number two on my list. Huh, there you go. Uh, he's, he does a spectacular job of playing the role. He looks the part, and he does. it's just fun to watch. Um, I know I, there's they come out with three two hour movies every couple of years, and I want there to be more. Yeah, there needs to be more, and I, I know there's probably not going to be because Cumberbatch is busy doing other stuff, and and Frodo is off doing other things now. As you know, everybody has <laughs> you know, used this as a jumping point to go other other directions. Yeah. Um, yeah. But every so often, I'd like to you know, come back. Come back. You're not done. There's more. Do more. Um, but yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch, spectacular Holmes. And now, yeah, now and comes then, what I'm curious about. Uh, I want to know who you have for number one in this. Apparently, there's a movie called Holmes and Watson coming out in 2018. Interesting. Of course. Um, okay. Well, oh that's... no, that's the one with uh, John C. Riley <laughs> and and what's it? Will Ferrell. Nope, this is a Coen Brothers Isn't production. It? Okay. And I had not heard of it until just this moment. Anyway, um, I'm going to preface this. First, I have to ask you this. I have to ask you yes. for a spoiler. Uh, Go ahead. I'm, I'm hoping your number one is not Robert Downey Jr. No, no, it's not. Okay. The reason I said I'm hoping it's not because to me, those movies were very, very popular. They're fun, but they effed up the casting so badly because Jude Law should be Holmes in those films and Downey should be Watson and they couldn't do it because the star is Downey and you can't have him playing Watson but they, they, would, they would fit the role so much better doing it that way so much better that I'm always going to find the interview the there was an interview that uh, Graham Norton did with Robert Downey Jr. and Ed Byrne happened <laughs> to be on the couch with them Oh, cool. And they did a, a, a skit uh, as a black uh, – how a talk show would work in silent movies. And the first question <laughs> they asked him, this is going to make sense. I'll put it on the website, and you'll laugh your ass off because it's very funny. Uh, the first question they ask, that they asked Robert Downey Jr. is, so you're playing Sherlock Holmes. Why didn't they give the uh, that role to a proper British actor? <laughs> and everyone just kind of goes – well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll put it on the website. You can watch it. It'll be funny. That's hilarious. Who do you have? Who do you have for your, anyway, your my number one. top Holmes? Yes, my top, my top home. Yes, we're running late. Basil Rathbone. That was my first Holmes, and he played him. I, Rathbone is is brilliant because he's not likable in those old films either. 
Uh, Watson was strictly no. comedy relief in the old ones, but Rathbone was was played as this brilliant um, misogynist, uh, which that's the character. And I have a feeling that's probably not yours. I f- it might be. Well, when you say it, then I'll say, yeah, that guy was very close for me. But to me, it has to be Basil because he he was great as, as Sherlock Holmes. Your number one is for me. Is. For me, Basil was three point five. Um, I wanted to put him on the list, but I've only seen actually one of his movies. I've got three of them, and I need to get around to watching the other two <laughs> at some point. But uh, for me, the number one is actually Johnny Lee Miller. Really? Okay. Because, I thought you were going to go with Jeremy Brett. No. Anyway, um, Johnny Miller. Go. Johnny Lee Miller is similar to uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, only mm-hmm. set in New York. Uh, Joan Watson is uh, – yeah, it's a Joan Watson instead of a John Watson. Right. Uh, he plays a – it's a very quirky, very unlikable Holmes, but at the same time, you really like him. Um, but it, it's – it, it's Bennett Cumberbatch only set in New York, so and done <laughs> kind of, on yeah. a regular basis. I, I, I like the way that they're doing it. Um, I have yet to actually see him in anything that I haven't liked him in. It's a fun show. It's definitely a fun show. Uh, it, it comes on in what three hours? So uh, yeah, <laughs> give it a shot. CBS, go right ahead. It is a fun and show. I did. I did. Briefly, quickly, should have mentioned this before we did this, but I want to mention that Feud is also on tonight. Feud was – the first episode was great. That's the – it's the show on FX. And it's about the feud between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford on the set of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. It's an awesome show. Time after time, I made it for 45 minutes of the, of the debut and turned it off because they made some really stupid decisions in writing, and they took the lazy way out, <laughs> and I don't want to watch it anymore, which is a shame because the actors were good, but the writing – became stupid and irritated the hell out of me, but it saves me an hour a week now. So thank you for that. So tonight you have elementary, you have feud, you have, or if you haven't listened to us yet, or you could listen to us again. How weird. Hey, go ahead. There you are. And if you want to hear us in other things, we have other shows that we've done and other shows that we will be doing. For example, what have you got coming up this week? Uh, apparently, we will probably be doing another baseball, beer, and barbecue, which, of course, we were on last night, and that is ev- available eternally as a podcast. We will be back this Saturday, and we will finally have our official, real, honest-to-gosh preview of the baseball season, where when we predict everything, and we will make fools of ourselves when this season plays out. And, of course, there is also, at Tuesdays, there is the <clears throat> excuse me, Cover 32 Seahawks show, and Wednesday with Lee and Kevin... And then on Wednesday, there is the fabulous Late Night Parents with the fabulous Ted Hicks, which is true. He is fabulous. Yes. He doesn't like to think of that one, but he is. He's fabulous, especially fabulous. when he wears his one outfit. Anyway, yes. And your shows, sir? <laughs> oh, this week, there's going to be another FWAT episode. Episode? Yeah, I can speak. <laughs> yeah, well, um, was. What was that Rush song called? Yeah, uh, Probably tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know. I'll get around to it. It's an irregularly scheduled episode anyway, Uh, but this Wednesday, another two pages of mystery episode. This week, a very public body discovered at the biggest hotel in town means the whole team gets to work on a case involving a body that doesn't want to stay on the floor. It's a story Mm. called Elevator Man, so check that out on uh, twopagesofmystery.com. It's a fun show. It is indeed a fun show. And uh, but big changes are coming for it soon, and you'll probably hear about it here first. Cool. Maybe there, but one of the two places. <laughs> if it's not here, it will be there, and if it's not there, it will be here. Regardless, I'm going to tell you about it here so you can just listen to both anyway. There you are. Any closing arguments, so sir? I hope not. Well, in that case. I, I refuse to get any more new tires for my car, so there. <laughs> that Goodbye. <laughs> I think they were left in live in Montana. I was thinking of the immortal words of Socrates, who said, I drank what? Man, we have a weird job. It's shameful, but uh, it, it's a living. Dorn, that's the end. <laughs>